Thank you very much. And we will be introducing our last speaker, Dr. Roger Hartle from Vail Cornell Medical College and U.S. Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Uh, Dr. Roger Hartle is a professor of neurosurgery and director of spinal surgery and neurotrauma. Uh, he is a leading name in the world in the minimally invasive neurosurgery and spine surgery and requires no introduction. We are absolutely honored, Roger, that you can join us uh, for our panel. Um, you can go ahead and do the slide share now. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I've been listening to some of the speakers and... Uh, I really want to congratulate uh, Anila and the organizers for putting together a great, great online symposium. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this. And uh, I was asked to uh, talk to you about MIS TLIF. And uh, I'll be happy to do that, of course. Um, I'm, at, uh, I'm a neurosurgeon. I do mainly spine surgery. At, uh, I'm located at Wild Cornell, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital in, in New York City. And um, a fair amount of my practice is minimal invasive spinal surgery. And um, I want to talk to you about MIS TLIF, which really has become uh, one of the main uh, MIS procedures that surgeons do. And there's fairly good data that it uh, is a uh, very helpful, very successful operation for especially for degenerative uh, uh, issues, of course. First introduced probably in the early 2000s by Kevin Foley, who really pioneered this operation and, uh, and, and then really developed further by many, many surgeons. And now I think it's a, it's a total standard operation that we do uh, uh, several times a week uh, in appropriate patients. Now, where's the benefit of MIS? I just want to show you this uh, because uh, it really illustrates the importance of MIS TLIF and some of the principles that are behind this operation. If you, look at, um, if you look at open traditional surgery and you, and you plot the complexity versus invasiveness, you can see that um, it, it goes up pretty steep and uh, procedures, as the complexity increases, the uh, procedures become pretty invasive uh, at an early stage. Now with minimal invasive surgery, you essentially you flatten that curve. And that's the benefit. So the difference between those two curves, that's really the benefit zone between, between, uh, for, for MIS surgery. And MIS TLIF is right in the center. So I think it really has become a workhorse procedure for those of us who do MIS surgery together with uh, the translumbar or OLIF types of procedures and obviously the uh, MIS decompression through tubular or endoscopic retractors. So, so, so just to show you that it is such an important part of what we do as MIS uh, surgeons. Now, um, I also want to talk, uh, as, I, as I walk you through my workflow for MIS T-lift surgery, you'll real, real, you will realize that I use a lot of navigation. And I know that navigation is not available to some of the participants probably of the course at this point. Maybe some of you have it already. Uh, however, I know that the technology is evolving. More and more surgeons are going to have it available. And that's I want to give you a little bit of an uh, idea as to how to integrate navigation into your uh, MIS TLIF surgery and really into most of uh, the fusion procedures that we do and even some of the decompression procedures. Now, we, uh, we, I've been using navigation for you know, 15 plus years, first in brain surgery and then uh, when I started doing uh, uh, spine surgery, we really translated that. And we, we use it now for about 75% of our cases. So there's hardly any uh, uh, fluoroscopy being used. Nobody wears lead. And we use navigation really from start to finish. We use it to plan uh, the skin incision uh, when we do our cases to insert the screws, to place the tubular retractor to do the decompression and so forth. And um, it's like everything with technology, you kind of become used to this and, and you extend the applications. We published this, we published our experience with um, navigation uh, for MIS T-lift surgery a few years ago. And uh, as I mentioned, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Now we use this type of navigation, which is an integrated system that combines navigation uh, with an, a true intraoperative CT scanner. But you can do the same thing with fluoro CT type uh, uh, setups. Now the workflow for MIS T-lift that I use currently is depicted on the slide. I insert the reference array for the navigation into the iliac crest. We get a spin, 
and then we navigate the screws. Uh, we insert the screws through two skin incisions. Um, it's very, uh, since we don't use fluoroscopy, obviously, you have to make 100% sure that you trust the accuracy of your navigation and the certain tricks to do that. Um, and then uh, once we have inserted the screws, uh, we'll put in the uh, tubular retractors. We use navigation for that. We do the discectomy, we do the cage, and then at the end, before we put the rods, we get a final spin to make sure that everything is accurate. Uh, that's the uh, setup in the operating room uh, when the patient is being prepped. So that's the intraoperative CT scanner, anesthesia, uh, the scrub nurse. We have the navigation unit here. I use a microscope. As you can see, there's no fluoroscopy needed because, uh, again, we uh, rely on, on navigation. And you have to become comfortable. There's not something you can just start doing. You really have to um, uh, go through uh, some efforts to make sure that your navigation is 150% accurate. Uh, when we get the scan, everybody leaves, so there's no, so there's no, um, uh, there's no um, uh, radiation to the surgeon or the staff. Uh, this is the uh, patient being uh, taped to the operating room table for navigation. Again, we rely on navigation, so I tape the patient down. All the soft tissue is under tension, uh, and that increases the accuracy of the navigation. Uh, obviously, we, that's, I mark the iliac crest here, uh, and, uh, and then we get the spin and start uh, navigating. Uh, the iliac crest, the, the reference array is attached to the iliac ilia crest here via two pins. I mark the midline here. The iliac crest is marked just for reference when you put in the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, when you put in the, the pins. That's uh, when we get the CAT scan, so we uh, uh, tape, uh, we, we cover the patient and then we start the operation. And as you can see here, from the very beginning, even the skin incision is being planned with navigation. And you plan the skin incision in a perfect trajectory for the pedicle screws. So an elongation of the pedicle trajectory to the skin. You make the skin incision here. You make the fascial incision here. And then you have a perfect trajectory into the pedicle. We call that don't fight uh, the fascia. If you make the skin incision here and the fascial incision over there, You'll, you'll introduce potential inaccuracy when you put in your screw because you have to push against the fascia and that may change the anatomy. I'm just giving you some, some of the little tricks and tips that we kind of learned over the years to really maximize accuracy. Now, uh, we, uh, several companies now have these types of pedicle screws available. These are single pass pedicle screws. As you can see here, they incorporate a K wire into the tip. They have a very aggressive screw tip. We navigate this pedicle screw and that allows us to really cut down on the number of instruments that we have to navigate. Uh, so there's no gym sheeting needle, there's no awl, there's no tap. Everything is incorporated into this uh, pedicle screw. Makes it very easy and makes, makes it very cost effective and time effective to insert this pedicle screw under navigation. So, um, um, so that's the pedicle screw. Uh, it's navigated as you can see here. That's the tip of the pedicle screw. And we... Um, uh, we register it uh, for the navigation system. We have a small skin incision here. Uh, we tap so the KY that, that's sticking out uh, attaches to the, uh, the, the bone. And then we insert the pedicle screw under direct uh, navigation. Um, you can see here that uh, uh, you, know, you really have to uh, obviously make sure that you penetrate the bone. So we we've used this pedicle screw now maybe for a year and a half or two years. And we've been very happy with this. Every pedicle screw takes about two and a half minutes uh, and, uh, and is very accurate overall. Now, um, uh, once we have the pedicle screw inserted, uh, we'll, we'll harvest uh, a bone from the iliac crest. And again, we use navigation for that. Uh, you, can, uh, you can navigate your little harvesting device uh, through the same incision. You've got some nice bone graft for your interbody fusion later on. Uh, and then you place your tubular retractor uh, so again, for, for that, we use navigation, as you can see here. Uh, you uh, make a second fascial incision that's more medial uh, from the incision that you made for the pedicle screws, and then you place your tubular retractor. And now this, these are some drawings from, from AO Spine. We worked with AO Spine on, a, uh, on teaching material for MIST lift surgery. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so this uh, shows you the MIST lift on the right side at L4, L5. Uh, so you place your tubular retractor, and then you see the facet joint here under the, uh, under the microscope. I use this 
I do this with a microscope, but you can do it with loops as well. And then you start uh, orienting yourself. And again, you can use navigation for this. Uh, it sounds a little bit, uh, uh, maybe uh, initially, if, you're not, uh, if you haven't done that, it sounds uh, maybe uh, as overkill. However, once you start using navigation, it, becomes, it comes in very handy. For example, here you can, you know you're gonna drill and you wanna get into the parse to, dis to uh, uh, disengage the intra-articulating process. So you can uh, look at the uh, navigation, it shows you the parse, uh, so you know exactly where you have to drill to from the inferior edge of the L4 lamina, for example. So you do that, you drill from the inferior edge of the L4 lamina towards the parse here. Uh, you remove the piece of bone and then you use that for your fusion later on. And this, by the way, is, is exactly the same that you would do with open T-lift surgery as well. Um, uh, so you try to remove the facet joint to get access to the disc space and then do a decompression. The next step then is um, we, you can do with a, with a ball tip or with navigation, you can find the uh, L5 pedicle here and you drill or you can use an osteotome. And again, you disconnect the superior articulating process here to harvest that bone for your fusion. Um, in this case, we use navigation to find the pedicle. Then, uh, then you see the space, uh, you see the uh, traversing nerve root here, the exiting nerve root there. And then you start uh, working on your discectomy. And here also navigation can become handy, especially in patients who have a very collapsed display, disc space or where it is hard to really get into the disc space. You can use navigation to find a step off in patients where um, there is significant uh, spondylolisthesis. And then you can confirm that you actually got into the disc space and uh, are in the, in the right position. Uh, at that point then, once we've done the discectomy, uh, we use the bone that we harvested, we grind it up, and we put it into the disc space and into the uh, cage. And that's planning of the cage here. Uh, again, you, use sim you can simulate the cage, the positioning of the cage exactly in the middle, uh, and that's where navigation also uh, comes in very handy. Uh, and uh, that's placement of the uh, titanium cage through the tubular retractor. This is the bone graft that has been placed into the, into the disc space. Now we put the cage in here. And... Um, Again, we use navigation to make sure that we have nice uh, placement. Now, a lot of patients will require a decompression. Some patients may have severe lumbar spinal stenosis. So in those patients, now, uh, you want to do a, a decompression of the, the, the spinal uh, canal, the fecal sac, and that's when the over-the-top decompression comes in. So now we're, we're uh, rotating the table away, uh, and we're angling the tubular retractor to get access to the inferior uh, portion of the spinous process, and then eventually to the contralateral lamina. We, pr we leave the, uh, dura, the uh, uh, ligamentum flavum sometimes intact, or we protect the dura with suction tip, and then we drill and uh, decompress the spinal canal. So that's essentially uh, what we do here. We get a bilateral decompression from a unilateral approach, and we call that over-the-top decompression. Navigation can be helpful here, to confirm that you made it all the way to the other lateral recess and you can actually do a contralateral foraminotomy there and again navigation can help you to confirm that there's even a movie that was made about this over the top my joke for the day <laughs> so uh uh and then finally uh then we get a scan once everything has been um uh once everything has been inserted we get a sca scan to make sure that the screws are fine and then the rods are being placed. You can also get a reduction of the spondylolisthesis if you want. In this case, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do that. Uh, but uh, there are other things you can do now. You can, uh, you can uh, there are some pedicle screw systems available. In the US, there was a big deal to get the pedicle screws that are actually suitable and FDA approved for cement injection. Now they're available. I know in, in, in Europe and Asia, uh, you fed those for a long time. Or sometimes uh, we have patients who have two-level lumbar stenosis, and in those patients, we will do, for example, if they have instability at one level, but no, instabil no instability at the other level, we will do an MIST level at L4-5, and just a tubular decompression at the level um, above. And we call that one and a half T lift. We just published that, and that works very nicely. It really avoids a two-level fusion in those patients where it's not, uh, where it's not needed. Uh, sometimes, <clears throat> however, you have to do a two-level T-lift, and that's a case here where we did a, uh, uh, a tandem slalom MIS uh, T-lift, 
Uh, we had two microscopes available. So the assistant or the fellow worked on the other side. So did one, one side of the T-lift, I did the other one. We put the cages in from opposite sides, as you can see here. So that's where MIS becomes really interesting. Once you can really match, mix and match and use different uh, types of technology and uh, hopefully cut down on some of the time uh, and make this whole um, MIS surgery more time uh, efficient. Because as you know, if you have to do everything yourself, it takes quite some time, even, even if you have experience and if you're good. So um, we wrote up our experience with navigation and spine surgery and um, was published in World Neurosurgery a few years ago. And we found that uh, overall in our spinal practice, and I'm talking about not only my practice, but also my colleagues here at, um, at, uh, at Wild Cornell, we eliminated fluoroscopy really in about 75% of our cases. And we think that navigation makes uh, surgery safer. Uh, there's really no malplacement anymore. If, if there is malplacement, you can uh, pick it up while the patient is still in the operating room and therefore fix it. It's very time efficient once you get used to it, once you have your team on board. And it is cost effective because it prevents uh, revision or it avoids uh, revision surgeries, which are very expensive. Uh, facilitates some of the more complex procedures and uh, especially MIS. So I also, at the end of my talk, I want to make you aware of an effort that is ongoing right now through AO Spine. And um, uh, so we're, we're putting together a, an MIS uh, curriculum uh, that will be taught at all the MIS uh, spine courses uh, worldwide uh, through the AO. And uh, we, uh, we talk about MIS TLIF procedures. We talk about uh, uh, basic skills, such as using the microscope, uh, navigation, how to fix a CSF uh, leak through a tubular retractor. We talk about endoscopic procedures. So if you have an interest in, in getting involved or if you have, uh, the, we're still at a relatively early stage, uh, let me know and I'm happy to share some more information with you or uh, look out for this at some of the upcoming AO Spine courses, uh, uh, maybe next year where this uh, will hopefully be put into practice. So, uh, and for those of you who want to come to New York, we have our 13th MIS Navigation Augmented Reality Endoscopy course in December at Wall Cornell. Let me know. I'm happy to uh, uh, get you involved. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you so, so much, Dr. Roger Hartel, for a wonderful talk. And uh, also for letting us, all the participants, know that if they are interested in pursuing a, a workshop in MIS, they can either go to your institute or can... Uh, registered through one of the AO spine in the nearby regional areas. Um, this uh, ends our symposium uh, on minimally invasive spine surgery. I am uh, thankful to all the organizers, Divya, Hira, Sharon, Dr. Rupesh, and uh, Abhi, and uh, every one of us who had helped to put this course together. I'm thankful to all the giants in spine surgery who have actually come here uh, to teach this course on a Sunday, which is usually a family day. Uh, and I uh, also want to let the participants know that this whole uh, video is actually available on YouTube. Uh, should you wish to see it again later on in your spare time, or if you want to wish to share it with your other colleagues. Uh, with this, uh, John, I think I'm going to end uh, the symposium right now. If anybody has a burning question, uh, just one or two for one of our participants, please come up right now and uh, uh, tell the question. Yeah. Hello. Dr. Patiban, yeah. Go ahead. Dr. Roger, it was excellent talk. And, uh, Really enjoyed that uh, the talk on navigation. Uh, definitely, navigation has changed the uh, the minimally invasive spinal surgery. Uh, that's what I feel. But the, it's really well, wonderful that uh, you are using uh, double microscopes in two ways so that it cuts short the time and the navigation procedure becomes much easier. It's, it's very wonderful. Yeah, nice. I mean, I would also pass on the, means, uh, extend my thanks to all the speakers for taking your time.
on Sunday and all the panelists. Mm -hmm. And please, uh, means if you have any suggestions, suggestions to improve or what you want to uh, like do for the next time or any comments, like you can, uh, you feel free to pass on the uh, information to us and comments to us so that uh, we can do better in the next online symposiums. So thank you. Thank you all.